Good evening, everyone. Um, for our last seminar series, we have a special guest, Dr. Professor Michael Woodbrook. Um, he is a leading researcher in artificial intelligence and natural language processing, and he's building a, a new research lab called Broad AI at Open University. And prior to this, he was a distinguished research staff at IBM in New York. Over to him. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what uh, Broad AI, uh, AI might be and how it's distinguished from uh, um, the sort of most uh, both historical AI and uh, the AI systems which are having most success at the moment. And then I'll sort of illustrate that a little bit with uh, um, some work that's been uh, done in question answering. And sorry if I'm a little bit hesitating. I um, have been involved in some government process for the last three days and I uh, haven't really had enough uh, uh, sleep. So we'll try, uh, uh, and since I've been recorded, I can't say controversial or citing things in order to keep myself awake, so we'll just have to see how it goes. Um, all right, so uh, AI has had a, uh, a long history, right? A surprisingly long, uh, uh, maybe a surprisingly long history if you view it through a particular lens. Um, so, in the, in the kind of two different types of AI that I'll talk about a little bit uh, um, uh, more. So, in one point of view, this this is a page from um, Aristotle's Organon, which I would say is sort of one of the first publications in artificial intelligence in the sense that uh, the, it was one of the first publications um, regarding something like mathematical logic or formal logic. So if you think about uh, AI, part of it is to understand what, what the nature of thought is and to codify that with the, uh, enough exactitude that you can have uh, purely mechanical processes carry it out. Right? So in this case, it's sort of AI to be run on human beings with the purpose of increasing the reliability of the inferences that you want to achieve. Right? So they didn't have, they didn't have um, computers yet, but they did have uh, human beings that could use their underlying platform in a different way. Um, uh, similarly, um, and then sort of uh, um, that, that, that kind of trickled along for a long time, and then uh, sort of the, um, in the Victorian era, there was, uh, people got really uh, kind of obsessed with mathematical precision, right? So at that point, um, so uh, you'll be able to exactly um, solve problems with complete reliability, right? Um, and also with minimalism, right? So uh, they you know, wanted the simplest possible uh, theories, um, the simplest possible models of some kind of thought, right? So that led uh, to modern versions of mathematical, mathematical logic, which are um, you know, very general uh, and also uh, which are very general compared to um, perhaps earlier attempts, um, but also it's, um, in the sense that you can say many things in them, uh, but also extremely difficult to codify knowledge in because of this minimality, right? You have to, um, you, know, you can write down the ways of uh, encoding stuff in a, in, in a page, and you can write down the uh, rules of inference again in, in, a, in a page. Right, so it's completely reliable, but it's also completely unusable, um, more or less. Uh, see, I uh, kind, of, kind of avoid a little bit of controversy. Is it? And so I, I spent 15 years of my life working on uh, uh, AI systems uh, based in mathematical logic. Um, and it's not completely unusable. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, uh, around the same time, people were starting to build machines, which, in principle, were capable of executing the this very small set of rules in order to perform these inferences. So we're um, disconnecting uh, kind of reasoning from its natural basis by abstracting it, and we were starting to build machines where you might take advantage of that uh, disconnection then. So, I don't know, progress, uh, things like um, uh, uh, Schwindler here, um, which uh, is kind of a parlor trick where you, uh, where you can translate English that's constrained to be very close to mathematical logic and uh, um, solve some problems uh, in planning, uh, planning how to move virtual blocks around. And this is some output from uh, from Psych. It's, a, it's an explanation um, of a proof in mathematical logic about uh, you know, how some guy might get around on his um, uh, vacation <coughs> using a segue. Uh, in the segways that uh, they were uh, replaced by lime scooters, which have now been banned. Right? Um, right. So, uh, um, so that's kind of you know. So 
this is kind of a relatively involved uh, proof of a very, very large uh, theory in that natural logic with a system which can sort of uh, uh, fairly well generate natural language uh, glosses of what it's deciding. So that's kind of, um, uh, I'd say that Psych is kind of um, more or less up to now the uh, acme of achievement in terms of uh, reasoning systems based on, on that natural logic. And that is where I spent uh, aforementioned uh, 15 years working on that system. Um, at the same time, um, uh, there's been this other thread where we, we don't uh, try to completely abstract things. We try to understand how these computations are done in, on uh, performed on human beings, right? So this is sort of the neural network approach. And again, uh, you know, uh, pretty pretty venerable. Um, this is some um, uh, stuff from. Uh, now, so I'm beginning to, uh, to, to forget the details, uh, but uh, so late 18th century, a guy called Ramon E. Cajal, um, who for the first time was producing um, high quality um, neuroanatomical diagrams. So actually understanding the hardware uh, to some extent on which this uh, human thought, that thing is terrible. We need to, we need to get better at that, right? Uh, understanding the hardware on the, yeah, um, just, right, uh, um, someone in bioengineering, um, you can add a camera to that and have it switch off the beam which goes in my eyes because I'm in the way anyway, it's not doing any good, right? So uh, put, a, put a computer between, uh, between that and me so it has not uh, blinding me. Um, all right, so, uh, so we, we begin to understand a little bit about how this stuff works with humans and people um, then what? You have, no, uh, like the laser no, no, no I, I think I'd actually rather point, uh, point at the screen if that's okay. I don't like uh, laser pointers very much. Um, right, so, so we uh, operate it. Huh? <laughs> 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 uh, um, yeah, so there's, oh, you say I'm getting in the way, and even if I had a laser pointer, I couldn't point at that one. So uh, anyway, right, so we, we, we begin to get an understanding of um, what sort of uh, anatomical structures um, underlie human thought. And um, then we start the process of sort of abstracting that into uh, computational platforms. Um, you know, so there was uh, uh, Douglas Hebb in uh, about 1948, I think, uh, made a theory of learning in neural-like neural uh, um, structures, right? Which uh, was pretty good theory, uh, theory something like Hebbian learning, if you implement it, it actually uh, works more or less. Um, and there was also uh, people were building perceptrons where they were, you know, linear, um, linear cells without a, uh, a, a threshold turned out to be a mistake, right? Um, uh, so this is a hardware implementation of Zetron. Um, <coughs> and and uh, you could do some interesting things with them, but this uh, uh, linear transfer function was a mistake. So uh, a little bit ironically, it turns out that um, instead of having, you know, reasonable uh, transfer functions like that, which is sort of like uh, you know, the, logis uh, the logistic uh, function, which is kind of more like what um, neural firing rates actually exhibit. Turns out that for neural networks, um, two pieces of linear stuff uh, um, stapled together, an uh, REL unit, which is, uh, yeah, so it's, it's one, it's 15 deg one 15 degree angle off being a uh, perceptron, uh, actually works better. So I, I find that extremely annoying, um, but it's true. So we have to, we have to live with it. Uh, and then um, uh, that stuff went along with sort of ups and downs, uh, including sort of an overreaction to finding out that linear transfer functions were uh, not all that uh, computationally general. Um, then in the early, um, the late 1970s, early 1980s, people developed a neural network training algorithms which could have a non-linearity and which, uh, had, um, which we know uh, can serve as general bunch of approximators if you have uh, yeah. an infinitely large or unboundedly large uh, hidden layers. Like that was good, much better than, uh, yeah, much better than um, a, a linear transfer function. And then that uh, went along for a while. Um, and then we were, uh, but computers were already started. So I went off to Carnegie Mellon in 1986 and I was working on neural networks. And oh my goodness, how slow were computers then? And they were a lot faster than they'd been before. But you know, uh, some some neural network with like a hundred units in it, you could spend two weeks training that, right? So, uh, right. But then, then in a piece of luck, 
Um, uh, humans turned out to be frivolous and required entertainment, and they required entertainment with huge computational requirements. So uh, we got GPUs, um, and after far longer than it should have taken, people noticed that the GPU architecture was um, well, very similar to a computer that we had programmed back from on back in the uh, 1990s. Um, uh, uh, and because uh, GPUs were around for almost 10 years before people actually did the work to map back prop onto it. Right, so that was, that was a strategic mistake by humans, a uh, tactical mistake, uh, also a strategic and tactical mistake by me because I should have quit my job and gone ported that code to two GPUs. Um, uh, but, you know, so so uh, we suddenly got machines which were very much faster. We could start running these things which had been around for like uh, 20, 30 odd years um, at a speed which mattered. And we got um, this, um, whatever it's called, ComNet, yeah. Um, and uh, um, with uh, approximately the same number of neurons as three Bs. And all of a sudden, computers began to be able to do stuff. Um, well, so that was rather long-winded. Um, so there's another way of uh, viewing these two types of um, AI, or these two types of systems, right? Um, and this is uh, uh, something that um, Daniel Kahneman uh, has called so, so System 1 and System 2. And you can sort of characterize it with respect to what kind of animals is about them or, or what kind of capabilities you, uh, you get. So there's this sort of System 1 skill, right? Um, the things that we do very quickly, we do them all the time. It's kind of difficult. Uh, they're automatic. You can't switch them off. It's like uh, I look at that. Um, some flag goes on. My brain which says back and mine and brown. Right? And I, I, I don't have much to do with that. Right? It doesn't seem to take any apparent uh, um, effort, and it's very hard for me to disrupt it. Um, uh, stereotype, they, uh, they happen sort of the same way, kind of more or less every time, even if they're a little bit more complex than rec object recognition. Um, and uh, the emotional figures are uh, so a, 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 a little bit um, uh, maybe m misleading, but they're, they're, they're kind of tied, you know, maybe tied a little bit more to uh, motivation, right? So things like recognizing stuff. Uh, Food, recognizing that someone is someone that you like, all those things, yeah, I think are, are more, uh, more, more uh, underpinned by these sorts of skills. But also, skills are more likely to be affected by them than what we have in system two, which is reasoning. And all sorts of things can do this, right? Uh, mammals, birds, fish, insects, reptiles, almost anything which has more than a few cells in it kind of does some form of a skill um, computation. I think, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether you count uh, a plesia, um, but really simple things as uh, even having skills. I think they're more, you know, they're more like, they're dumber than a Roomba, right? So uh, uh, a Roomba has a skill, right? I mean, uh, it, 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 it cleans my apartment and it maps the floor and it tells me where the Wi-Fi is and so on. So I guess it's got a skill. Um, but you, 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 you don't expect very much from it. Um, yeah, sorry, Rod, that's true. Right. Um, OK, so the, the other system is this uh, kind of amazing one um, that humans have, right? Uh, reasoning. So we can take uh, problems, we can sort of just think about them for a while, and we come up with a solution, and then we can apply the solution. And we do that by essentially composing a bunch of skills and a bunch of other reasoning steps. Right? It's like really slow, it's right, right, unbelievably slow. Uh, humans are so bad at this. It's, a, you know, it, uh, it's almost beyond belief how terrible we are at this. Um, it happens infrequently. It ha it's, it's deliberate, right? Uh, when you're doing this process, that process is subject to uh, inspection by itself. Right? Uh, so you decide to do uh, reasoning, you sit down and do it, you give yourself a headache, you take a break, you come back, you do some more of it, right? but uh, you, you're, you're consciously deciding to do it. Reasoning um, is a little bit unconscious for very simple uh, versions of it, but it's mostly sort of consciously directed. Uh, it's compositional. Right? Once you've learned how to do a kind of reasoning, you can take it and apply it to another uh, place. It's also compositional in the sense that it directs the composition of skills. 
right? It tells you what skills to uh, achieve in uh, what order, um, but that they remain uninspectable, right? I, I still can't tell um, Lizard Brown, but if you tell me find three brown things in the room, right, I will uh, compose the skill of recognizing brown things and the, recognize, uh, the skill of directing saccades, right, both of which are automatic to do it. I can't find uh, another brown thing at the moment. <coughs> I think there's only one. Now there's a jacket there. Um, are those biscuits brown? Yeah, maybe. Um, kind of, kind of brown. Right. So three brown things. Um, flexible and uh, it, 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 it's, it's rational. Um, when you're doing this process, the outcome of it is, unless the skill, skills are interfered with, the outcome of it won't really be uh, determined much by your motivation. And this is done. This is a very rare thing. It's mostly the uh, province of uh, humans. Um, it's also perhaps done uh, you know, to some extent by apes, uh, by um, aquatic, some aquatic mammals, by uh, an octopus, perhaps uh, uh, parrots, especially kias, because kias are you know, bright even as carrots go, and parrots are pretty bright. Right, but. Even the other animals which do this, I, they're, they're like really bad at it compared to humans. And my view is that humans are really, really bad at this. Um, it's just that it so happens that being an animal that can do this at all gets you to rule the planet, right? Because there's no, because there are no animals that are good at this. We get to rule the planet, right? Um, but we're, but we're, we're pretty bad at this, I think. Um, and they give you, they, they make you a professor, and people sit around. Being quiet, um, you know, not doing, not doing primate things um, because you are talking to them about that. So, you know, it, 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 you know, this has been great for humans. So perhaps we should have more of it. Okay, uh, I'm not going to talk about that. So what, what's happened recently in AI? Right, uh, it's like you know, skills, skills, skills. They rule, right? Everything, right? So uh, you know, we suddenly got. We suddenly got very good over a short period of time at having computers able to learn to do skills where you could either provide a lot of data about what uh, doing those skills would constitute, or you could provide an environment um, which would uh, allow reinforcement learning of some sort to apply to allow you to um, hill climb in a, a fitness space with respect to the performance <coughs> of those skills. Right? So we got really good, really quite good at image recognition. Um, uh, we got uh, really good at playing games, right? And uh, uh, we, we might we might be almost done with that, right? Because this latest uh, thing from DeepMind, where not only you know, not only do you not give it previous games, right? But you don't even give it the rules of the games. You just give it a win lose signal. And for systems, um, for these sorts of uh, systems where you can kind of put write down the rules and the conditions of success uh, in a page or two, like chess or go or these other games. Because remember, humans are really bad at this stuff. So if we're going to learn those games, uh, you have to be able to write down the rules uh, in a couple of pages. Otherwise, we're not capable of learning to play these games. So for these, you know, for these simple games that human beings can play, you can pretty much you know, whack them with uh, a few hours of um, a few hours of computation on a reasonably large number of computers, right? So we, we got really good at that, and it's uh, beginning to, you know, it, it's beginning to seem like what's the point? <coughs> uh, you know, we, we still need to conquer um, video games as definitively, but that's obviously on the, uh, you know, that's obviously going to happen. We just have to wait and, you know, wait and wait and it'll happen. Um, uh, also, sort of, uh, you know. Um, I see object recognition also so, so speech uh, generation speech synthesis and generation has been uh, vastly improved um, uh, improved I think to approximately human performance by these systems I used to work on uh, on on speech recognition right so the the progress which has been made is pretty 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 miraculous and the <coughs> progress in speech synthesis the naturalness of speech synthesis I think is even surprising. It's surprising that with um, uh, little information about what the prosody should be, that the output is as natural as it is. Um, and then the stuff, uh, so all of that stuff, I kind of, um, back when I was in grade school in the um, late 1980s, early 1990s, I would have predicted that we would get quite good at these things. And other things like 
colorization. And I remember thinking about that as a neural network problem, right? So that was clear. What wasn't clear is uh, gener uh, you know, the success of generative uh, adversarial networks, right? And um, image uh, synthesis, face uh, synthesis, et cetera. I, I doubt that anyone um, predicted or understood in a sense, I and mean, whenever we succeed at one of these things, the lesson we should draw is not that we are extremely clever, right? But that the thing that we um, succeeded at turned out to be far simpler um, than we had thought, because dumb humans like us managed to get our computers to do it, right? So it turns out that uh, there's something much simpler about the structure of images, it, especially with respect to the kind of analysis that we do on them, which allows us to um, you know, understand them and to decide whether they're real or not, right? that is, pro is somehow simpler than we would have expected. I think you know, that's, that, that, that's kind of interesting and surprising. Right? So skills, we've got really good at them. Um, yay, humans. Um, but, now what happened to that knowledge of reasoning stuff, which means that we are in charge and the, uh, uh, what were the other creatures over there? Um, mice. Well, mice aren't in charge, you know, the uh, um, fish aren't in charge, uh, the insects, uh, you know, even the wetters, which are super scary, they're not in charge. Uh, maybe they think they are. Uh, right, so uh, what, 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 what happened to that, right? Because uh, AI has been kind of focused on <coughs> doing things which are, uh, you know, they're, they're human skills, but they're kind of the sorts of things that other animals can learn to do. Uh, not playing chess and go, right? That's, that's you know, that, there's much, not much hope for other animals with those. But yeah, how, and how do, we, how do we combine them with this recent enormous success in uh, learning, learning skills, and um, well, in performing skills and doing, um, um, yeah. all right. And you know, what does that mean for broader and more general progress towards AI? Is that combination? Because I think this is going to drive, uh, this combination is going to drive things. It's pretty clear. Um, and then there's a, a follow-on question, which is a, a different topic. Is like, what does this mean for human civilization? You know, so what should we do as a result of this? Um, right. So, yeah. The, the, so the, the the part which has sort of um, not. Uh, it's been a threat of AI, and there are certainly people still working on it. Um, but it hasn't been part of this uh, recent eruption, right? Is symbolic AI. So, um, you know, what is what is the idea behind uh, symbolic uh, AI? It's that you should be able to build systems which can apply knowledge which is stored in a use agnostic form to solve new problems, right? And that's kind of what neural network systems mostly don't do at the moment, right? I, I certainly wouldn't um, buy into the uh, you know, the people who say that they're useless because they can't do this at all and so forth, and there's certainly stuff, uh, transfer learning, multitask learning and so forth, which uh, is hinting at this sort of capability, but it's kind of, it's a little bit far off at the moment, and this is this is what the, the point of symbolic AI um, was, and then in the context of machine learning, there's another way of thinking about sort of knowledge and reasoning, um, and knowledge in particular, in whatever form it takes, and that's that it is simple. Uh, you, know, you can think of it as simply a, a source of inductive bias, right? So it's um, it's a way of constraining the solution space for something that you want to learn to do, so that you can learn to do it with far fewer training examples. And a limit case of that is the case where you all, uh, your knowledge um, completely constrains the uh, solution space and you don't need any training examples at all to tune it and then you just solve the problem. But that's, a, you know, that's, the, uh, that's just a limit case of saying that it's stored in inductive, uh, inductive bias. Right? So at the moment, um, these experiments with, for a deep mind, especially this latest one, uh, are experiments on a completely tabula rasa, no knowledge at all. You're doing everything from learning. Can you... Um, induce what would have been knowledge. And yes, you can, but for relatively simple systems. For more complicated systems, human beings have found it advantageous to, uh, you know, first of all, teach, uh, um, and some other animals too, to some extent, um, to um, pass on, well, to store for further reuse uh, knowledge by like re remembering names for trees and so on, and uh, how to recognize them and connecting that to things like whether they're good to eat or uh, and so forth. And we do it explicitly in the form of knowledge. We've found it advantageous um, and possible uh, because of our neural architecture to do that uh, explicitly. Um, other animals have to kind of do it implicitly, uh, mostly. 
Um, but also, we've gone beyond that, right? We, uh, we doubled down on that by having language and uh, um, having oral history and passing this uh, down from generation to generation. Then we doubled down on that by inventing writing so that we could store vast quantities of this knowledge um, and pass it on. Then we uh, uh, invented printing so we could store vaster knowledge of it and broadcast it. Right? Then we invented um, the Dewey Decimal System Right, so that we could have enormous amounts of it and go and find the bits which are relevant to a particular um, topic. Then we invented um, information retrieval, um, which allows us to do that with enormous speed. Right, uh, and we're not we're not we're not we're not finished with that. Right, so uh, you know we're we're we've we've found knowledge enormously useful, and it seems likely that machines will too. So, there are kind of, uh, you can think of, um, so you might think that knowledge is stuff written down, it's, uh, I don't know, logic or mathematical theorems or something like that, right? Um, or that it has to be in some particular neural net uh, format in order to supply uh, uh, an inductive bias. So, I, I don't think that's true at all. So, knowledge is, um, uh, knowledge uh, it, it comes in a wide variety of, um, Forms. And one of the interesting ways in which knowledge um, varies is um, with respect to this trade-off we were talking about earlier, where the Victorians um, wanted to know how could you represent knowledge in ways which were completely reliably usable, right? So there was no question that you would conclude the same things from the same um, information. Um, Whereas, you know, in other areas of our civilization, we encode um, knowledge in a way which is uh, supposed to evoke um, uh, evoke inferences, evoke uh, mental states, right, within a certain range, but which are highly dependent on the uh, state of the um, of the listener. So, you know, for example. Uh, um, Poetry and song tend to be in that area uh, uh, when they're um, uh, when they're trying to evoke something in you. So uh, this is kind of uh, kind of interesting because most of the work in AI has been over, uh, and use of knowledge has been over on this end. But this is not the only uh, place you can be. And we as humans um, use things all along this continuum from precision and reliability, right, um, to uh, but. Unfortunately, low expressivity, it's really hard to represent things in these forms, to low precision and uh, reusability, but high expressiveness. So we, 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 we go along uh, this path, and one of the places on this uh, uh, path that I'm, I find particularly interesting, uh, you know, not because of the content, because who likes legal language? Uh, you know, maybe me a little bit, there's like some part of me that might have grown up to be a lawyer, uh, so some perverse part of me. But, um, but, uh, um, but this is an interesting case because legal language is like, like natural language. It has um, quite high expressivity, but it has been optimized so that um, if you take two different people who have been trained in its use, and give them the same piece of language, there's a very high probability that they will read the same entitlements out of it. That they will believe that the same conclusions can be drawn by combining it with other knowledge um, as would be drawn by someone else uh, skilled in this, right? So we're, we're um, optimizing for reliable, um, repeatable reasoning um, in the same way that we do for mathematical logic or mathematical theorems, but with much greater expressivity because of the range of things that the law can talk about. So I think that um, that's interesting. And then we have uh, other things like scientific writing, formal narrative, like uh, news articles and so on, which again, uh, you know, less reliably uh, understood in terms of uh, meaning the same things to different people, but uh, more, more expressive and more compact. So one <coughs> really interesting question is, um, uh, AI concentrate on there, but that's a bad place to concentrate on, uh, at least uh, it seems like a bad place because human beings cannot actually express knowledge in mathematical logic. Um, right. We're so bad at it. You know, the, the idea that we will take all the knowledge which is stored in uh, by uh, in a library, for example, and re-express it in this so the computers can process it is uh, implausible in the, in the stream. The idea that um, we might take that knowledge 
and push it in that direction a little bit so that it can support more reliable inferences than it does now is like less, less extreme. So imagine if scientific writing could be, um, if, if, it, if it could evolve in a direction so that you could more reliably, for example, work out how to replicate a paper, how to reduce um, the content of a paper to code. And I think it's very interesting to think about whether or not computers might be better um, at driving things in that direction than, than we are. Um, so it's not just text, though. Text is the, the main form that humans have used to store this knowledge, but you can think about exactly the same sort of continuum for, uh, um, for visual representations of knowledge. Um, and you can uh, um, even think of the same kind of continuum with respect to data-like things, right? Where you, um, where, uh, you know, for example, uh, the, the serial, uh, serialized data structure from a Java program is kind of like mathematical logic in, uh, in as much as if you suck it back into that program, it will behave in exactly the same way, right? You, you can completely determine, with, with respect to the program that generated it, you can completely determine its behavior. Um, and then there are things like knowledge graphs, which mean almost nothing. Uh, oh, there you go. Um, uh, and and, and uh, right, because they're, they're, they're kind of subject, uh, because the syntax is very unrestricted, right, and they're so, uh, highly subject to interpretation, right? So, you know, a, a bunch of triples with labels on them, on their own, mean uh, mean, mean, mean very little. So they're uh, kind of unconstrained. And then raw observations like the ones that you might find um, on a notepad in a frozen. Um, in a frozen hut in the Antarctica, uh, where someone perished taking them, right? They, some of them at least, are going to be kind of very imprecise, right? Um, and re require interpretation, require, for example, a historical context in order to understand what they mean scientifically. All right. So, um, you know, um, I'm sort of hinting at where I think we might go. We might go at making computers more able to manipulate these uh, forms of knowledge that we have developed for ourselves, but in sort of a more reliable computery uh, and faster um, and distributed and parallel computery sorts of ways. Um, right, so I think that's, uh, you know, that's kind of the, 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 maybe the trick here. Um, well, let's dig down a little bit on what, what, you know, what it would mean to do this sort of reasoning which has proved to be so good for humans um, uh, in a computer. Just to, just to be clear on what this re uh, recursive um, decomposition and um, problem solving looks like. Right, so imagine that we have a very difficult and important question like you know, is Auckland um, actually a city? Uh, I like this example because I can adapt it to wherever I'm giving uh, <coughs> a talk with minimal effort, just finding a, uh, a copyright-free picture. Um, right, and then there are sort of two ways, and then these are just my kind of prejudices encapsulated in uh, um, something which is a little bit like logic, but you know, there are two ways that you might determine that. Um, you might uh, think something is a city if it's the capital of a country, right? That's generally the case, um, maybe not completely reliably. Um, so we, um, we say, all right, we want to solve this problem. Is it Auckland a city? We've got this rule. It's a city, it's the capital of the country. So uh, let's work out whether it's the capital of the country. So is Auckland the capital of the country? No, it is not. Uh, was for a small period of time, a uh, very long time ago, but not anymore, um, even if it Lawns it over the rest of New Zealand in a obnoxious sort of way. Um, it's not the capital. Um, or it might be a city if it has more than 70,000 inhabitants. And again, that's just purely my rule of thumb because I find little towns that call themselves cities annoying. Uh, so I, uh, I want to rule them out, uh, which is also uh, um, you know, illustrates a risk with things like mathematical logic, right? If you make up a, a rule, which is purely um, you know, the uh, encoding of prejudice, right? then it will be carried out reliably by anything which executes those um, rules. So it's not just neural networks that learn to encode biases. Um, you know, there's a much more direct route for encoding biases in logic. Um, so now we need to do two, solve two problems. We're going to break this problem down into two problems. If we, uh, it, 
it says that we have to break down the problem into two problems, right? And if we can solve those problems separately and combine the results in the, just the right way, we can solve this problem. So two problems we have to solve is to find a number x where it's the number of inhabitants of Auckland and then determine whether x is greater than 70,000, right? And uh, you can solve this problem by saying, um, okay, Google, what's the population of Auckland? Um, uh, my phone's not listening at the moment, so, but yeah, at home that works. And it says that uh, it's 1.657 uh, million, or it was said that a couple of weeks ago, maybe it's changed its mind now. Um, and um, it's not the most demanding application of um, primary school mathematics to determine that uh, 1.657 million is greater than 70,000. And now we can plug, we can say, well, that's true, so that's true, potentially, depending on what, uh, whether we solve this one over here. This one's true, so that's true. Since both of those are true, um, uh, we've found the binding. At this point, we can uh, discard the binding. We don't actually care what the population is. We just know that we were able to solve both of these, so it meets the conditions of this rule. Right? And we know that if you meet the conditions of that rule, you can say yes. All right? So that's, you know, that, that all the kind of reasoning that people do, it doesn't have this sort of simplified form, but it has this structure, right? It has the structure of you identify a problem, you break it, you identify a means of decomposing that problem into sub-problems, you do that for as many steps as you need to, um, and you identify um, how to, and along with the rule, it's not just how to decompose it, but along with that comes knowledge of how to compose the answers into an answer to that problem. So the, the answers <coughs> to the sub problems and an answer uh, to the major problem. And that's sort of often kind of forgotten. That you, you, know, you can't just break down the problems and solve them. If you actually want an answer, you have to kind of um, bubble up the results um, using some uh, procedure in order to get an answer. So this is all we ever do um, with reasoning. We might go down many levels. Um, the number of possible rules is uh, very large, but that's, uh, you know, that's all this human, that's all this thing which lets us rule the world and not the, um, you know, not the, uh, I don't know, what might rule the world? Um, Penguins. Penguins. Penguins, yeah, that's, that would be cool, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. Uh, let's say we've got CRISPR now, maybe we can make sentient penguins and they can uh, take over from us because it's really tiring ruling the world, isn't it? Yeah, it's like, you know, at least in New Zealand we don't do much of ruling the world, so uh, yeah, safe, we barely need to rule ourselves. Right, so that, um, solving that problem is kind of trivial in uh, pseudo logic, so why don't we just code this up and make computers as smart as people? Well. Um, there are hundreds of thousands or millions of uh, facts or problem transformations that might be salient to solving a problem. You have to choose uh, between them, and choosing between them is intractable, right? So um, in chess or Go, right, in chess you've got an average of, I don't know what it is, 15 moves that you might make. In Go you've got an average of uh, 100. Uh, yeah, look, those numbers are wrong, look them up, but they're ballpark, uh, uh, ballpark right, right? Um, so we know how to solve these problems. In this case we've got um, a million possible moves that we might make, a million things, or a, um, yeah, even if we do information retrieval to find these possible rules, we might get a million of them from the library which seem like they might be relevant, we have to choose between them, that's really hard, so that's intractable. And then, uh, much as the computers might like it, even if we code up the straightforward way of doing this, hu uh, humans have not converted most facts and problem solving methods into uh, mathematical logic or computer programs or anything which can be performed reliably. Um, and uh, we're, we're just not good at it, right? Um, uh, the people at SciCore are the best in the world at converting general uh, knowledge into mathematical <coughs> logic, so it can be um, reasoned about in these simple ways, and you know, they're, they're, they're not a long way along the process of finishing, right? Uh, they're just further along than everybody else in ways which are informative and helpful, but they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna finish by human beings doing this, and they never really intended to. So it's also impractical, because we, we, even if we um, you know, tied down all seven million of us and 
you know, taught us to do the best job we can of this process, which is not very good, we still wouldn't make a dent on the problem, right? So the simple approach to this is not going to work. So what might work? Well, we have these machines, we have, we, we have very large numbers of computers now, right? And they're pretty fast. Um, they're not as fast as humans yet, um, but that's within reach where within one or two orders of magnitude, uh, our fastest computers, uh, depending on how you count it, within one, two, three orders of magnitude for multiply ads of a, of a human. Right, and uh, so eventually we don't, and I think you know, we, once you're within that, given that they can be optimized more, probably in the ballpark we'll be able to uh, approach this, right? So what might we do? Well, we apply these uh, skill learning techniques and, uh, and our game playing techniques to this problem, right? So uh, we can pretend reasoning is a game with far too many moves. That's why this problem hasn't been solved yet, right? We'll pretend it is and try and make the machines uh, learn to play that game really, really well. Um, because that seems to be working out pretty well uh, for us. Another is uh, um, pretend um, logic is a natural language. Right? So that's, uh, that, that, that's for the intractable bit, right? Get good at uh, making this choice. This is for the impractical bit. Uh, instead of trying to get human beings to do this thing that they are um, demonstrably unsuited for, um, we teach computers to do it, just as uh, um, human beings are demonstrably unsuited for translating Latin into Māori, but uh, there's probably no <coughs> human being uh, who's like really good at that, but Google Translate will do a decent uh, job of it, right? So uh, um, maybe we can get them to translate um, natural language into mathematical logic with uh, sufficient reliability and precision to allow uh, this computation. That's also super hard for a start. Um, we don't even have as much math mathematical logic as we do for a low resource um, language. Um, and uh, it's kind of difficult to work out how you even decide that you have. And you have to translate, when you're translating into a natural language, um, there are affordances. People will accommodate um, errors and they will interpret it. Um, for mathematical logic, it has to be exactly right in a way which is consistent with the um, and coherent with the entire rest of the knowledge base. It's like one one hundred percent, right? Even ninety nine point nine percent, any fraction, right? As the knowledge gets uh, bigger, um, you get exponentially higher probability of uh, incorrect um, conclusions, right? So it has to do this much better than we've ever um, um, be able to translate any uh, natural languages. And that's kind of the basis for why it's so difficult for human beings to do that too, because how can we tell whether our translation is coherent with um, several million or several billion or several quadrillion other facts expressed in mathematical logic? Um, but um, another thing that we might, so you know, we should try those things. Um, we, we should also try saying, all right, Suppose that we don't want the absolute guarantees that mathematical logic gives us, we just want to be better than humans, right? So we might uh, learn reasoning techniques which with quite high reliability can be applied to text and generate um, accurate inferences from it, right? So um, it's not that it's completely reliable, but if you give it, say, a scientific paper, um, it is more likely to for example, be able to identify other scientific papers that are claiming that is inconsistent uh, with or entailed by, right? And then that uh, in in English, right? And the, you know the cost of um, doing something in one of the more expressive languages is that you need very many more inference rules, right? Mathematical logic you can get by with well, one inference rule actually, a resolution, right? Um, but uh, in English, uh, in order to tell um, if two sentences entail each other, you will use a variety of different techniques to do that, quite a large variety, not an infinite variety, but so uh, uh, you know, that's probably in, uh, in reach. Um, and that, that's what we did on our reserve. I didn't actually write it in mathematical logic, although I could have, right? I wrote it in English, in a, and I modified the English to be kind of like um, logic, so that you're unlikely to disagree with what I say is the meaning of those sentences. Right? So, as I said uh, earlier, maybe we can have computers do this for more fields. Maybe, for example, um, news stories can be moved in a direction so that different reportings of those news stories have the same underlying representation and that there aren't incons and you minimize the inconsistencies between them when you translate them back into uh, text. Right? So that might work. Um, 
And another uh, uh, you know, approach that we might take is work on problems where um, human beings have actually done all this horrible work to uh, express things in what we think are completely reliable ways, um, in, in, in that's like theorems and mathematics. Right? And it's a, it's a curious fact that um, a, 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 only a very small uh, proportion of the mathematical theorems, <laughs> let alone uh, theorems in physics or material science or chemistry, have actually been formalized to the degree that they can be verified by a computer. Right? So uh, we, we, might get, um, we might get substantial benefit just by automating the process of formalizing them and then verifying, uh, verifying them. And the good news is that there are data sets of at least mathematical theorems represented in mathematical logic, and, uh, but for most of which no um, machine generated or machine verified proof uh, exists. So this is sort of the, this is the, the near term stuff. If any of this does, is, is going to work at scale, this pretty, we have to get, we pretty much have to get something like this working. So um, yeah, um, and I could leave it. Um, I can leave it at that. Uh, I can leave it at that, um, and take questions, which I think is probably the better idea. Or I can talk about uh, um, systems which do question answering, which uh, kind of approximate this uh, uh, this path. And I, my vote, and I, but I only get one, is that we stop now and uh, um, and we, we discuss uh, discuss this. Um, but you know, the, the field which is kind of moving in the direction that I'm talking about is the field of automated question answering, where you give a computer a question, and it <coughs> does, uh, instead of just giving you back a document, right, so information retrieval gives you back a document, current sort of state of the art for, for question answering, I'll just summarize it. I, I, I didn't take my vote after all, I'm just going to do what I want to. Right? Uh, um, so uh, the, 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 the state of the art was, you put in a question and it gives you back a document and you have to go through the document and maybe you find the answer or maybe you don't. Right? The current state of the art is uh, you give the computer um, either, a, uh, either a document and it finds an answer in it with pretty high reliability or you give it a corpus, it finds a document in that corpus and then identifies the text span which corresponds to the answer if there is such a text span and Fortunately, the same people who are doing these tests are designing them, so there's usually uh, such a, a text uh, span in the types of documents that they choose. Um, the, um, the, the really more cutting edge um, state of the art is that the question might be assembled using um, a very, uh, by selecting for a very small number of techniques for assembling an answer out of answers that you find um, either in two parts of the same document or in two different documents. And when I say two, it's really usually two at the moment, right? So we're making progress towards this, but we don't even have systems which can do the, um, the level of decomposition required for the, um, is Auckland a city um, uh, a problem. And when we do, I'll just add two more layers of decomposition of the questions and we'll be back to, uh, to scratch it. But we're, 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 we're getting there, so it's, it's, it's not no progress. But if you think about um, these sort of hundreds of millions of rules for how to solve problems, no, at the moment the state of the art systems have um, four, eight, ten, right? Uh, very productive rules. So they can do substantially better than the, you know, the status quo ante. Right, but um, you know, the, the, nothing like uh, nothing like it. So, um, but the, that setting, that question answering setting, provides a really great context for working on the sorts of problems in reasoning and learning to reasoning that I've expressed. And uh, I think I'll wrap it up there. Um, uh, please argue with me because it will help to keep me awake. Thank you. So, um, one of the things that sort of uh, nags in the back of my mind, this is an area that I don't know much about. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> is, you know, where does Goebbels and completeness theory um, fit in this? Because, you know, on, on one end you have, uh, um, 
the ability to express knowledge in a very codified way, you know, uh, um, and yet not particularly expressive. And yet, you know, most of our knowledge is uh, in rather loose language, much more expressive. Uh, um, and yet, that expressiveness is going to um, uh, lead to, uh, you know, many statements that uh, are completely undecidable, uh, according to. But there's, there's no evidence whatsoever. You know, Girls in, uh, Incompleteness Theorem is um, very general. There's no evidence whatsoever that any of the representations that human u humans use or any of the computation methods that human beings apply allow us to evade incompleteness. So you know, to the extent that this is true for computers, there's no reason to believe that it's not true for us. Um, and even there's not even evidence that quantum computers right, get you out of this uh, bind with incompleteness at all. So I'd say that um, you know, the evidence to date is that the problems which are unsolvable because of incompleteness are of no interest whatsoever to human beings. Uh, I actually have a, a sort of a hypothesis which goes further than that, which says that um, all of the problems which tend to be of interest to us are ones which are within um, a perhaps quite compact um, range of possible problems, uh, those being you know, more or less precisely the ones that we think we have a chance of solving. Right? So it's a, it's my, it's a, conjecture, a conjecture, for example, that SAT problems tend, um, uh, I don't know, uh, satisfiability problems, right? It's like, uh, is there an assignment of variables to this um, propositional logical formula, which um, of true values to the variables in the propositional logic th uh, formula, which means that the whole thing evaluates to true. Right? That problem is not to be NP complete, but very large numbers of such problems tend to be uh, solvable in quite a small amount of time by computer programs. Yeah. Right? So my conjecture is that that's true because we are kind of the ones defining what the problems are. And we aren't good at coming up with realistic problems, right? which are anything like unsatisfiable. Right? That we, we, we simply aren't very good at conceiving of meaningful problems which are close to being unsatisfiable. So it's a kind of, yeah, the conjecture, I guess, sort of an entropic, uh, entropic um, principle applied to set problems. Uh, so yeah, I don't, you know, don't, uh, you know, don't, don't hold me to, to this, it's a conjecture. I'm just making stuff up. Yeah. And, you know, after a couple of drinks, I talk to my colleagues about things like this. Um, but I, I think something uh, like that, uh, something stronger than that applies to incompleteness, right? The, um, if there are problems that are seriously affected by incompleteness, they are simply not problems that we are at a high level. They're simply not problems that uh, matter to us. Now, all the demonstrations of it are with respect to a constrained language, right? Um, where the incompleteness is with respect to the computation performed inside that language, right? But um, but you know you can keep on going upwards, and incompleteness still applies. So it's sort of a straw man argument um, to say that these uh, that these um, very restricted languages um, have this incompleteness problem. And even even when they do, the the nature of the incompleteness is not all that interesting. It's just sort of a demonstration of a mathematical fact. So I I, I, I don't think yeah you know, at least incompleteness is not going to bother computers any more than it bothers us because they can always expand the expressi expressivity of their languages as well. And probably, be, you know, if you think about the computational basis of the two systems, you know, there's a good chance that um, languages um, processed by computers can be more expressive than languages processed by humans. For example, we don't have par we have to serialize all our languages in a uh, particularly simple, uh, in, a, in a particularly uh, simplifying way. Right? Computers don't have to do that, so maybe they can be more expressive by having uh, um, you know, higher dimensional languages in some sense, or having uh, requiring more. Um, you know, we enforce uh, coherence constraints in reasonably simple ways based on so you know, grammatical rules, um, uh, weak semantic coherence. Uh, an agreement. Right? Imagine if you had to have provable agreement over thousands of different characteristics of your language. 
right? The, you know, the, in some sense, that would be more, expre uh, more expressive than uh, natural language, but it would also be impossible for us to deal with. So I, I, uh, yeah, so sorry, uh, I'm rambling a little bit, but I, I really don't think it's a, uh, a, a practical problem. <laughs> at least you didn't fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> This is just a comment, really. I, I found it um, really uh, encouraging. It seemed to me you, you started off saying that, in fact, humans were extremely poor at reasoning. And by inference, then it stated the construction of knowledge, which I think is a slightly different thing. That's the, the whole thrust of what you said, in fact, really says we're extremely good at that, doesn't it? Well, we're better than everything else. Well, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's... We thought we were good at chess and go, too. So much for that's that true. hypothesis. That's true, okay. So we're measuring it with respect to, right. <laughs> to a limited, uh, limited framework. And yet right. the, the complexity, it seems to me, uh, in terms of our logic and what we can understand the size is extraordinary. Oh, it is. It's, it's, it's remarkable what we've achieved. And it's sort of remarkable what we've achieved with poor... Um, equipment. I mean, think, think. Uh, I mean, we, we build, we, we build all these libraries, right? Um, yeah, for a start, you can, you only have one thread of attention, right? Yeah. There are seven billion of us. We, we, you know, collectively, we have seven billion uh, threads of attention, and they are running on uh, platforms that can send data for, uh, to other platforms at a few kilobits at best per second, right? You would never. You, Offer, offer to sell someone a computer system like that these days and see how much they want to pay for it, right? Uh, so, so I take it the other thing is too, the, the, the construction of, uh, of literature, poetry and music represents our highest expression of our, uh, of our base of, of uh, expression and, and knowledge. Is that, is, that what, is that what that said? No, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if... Uh, it, it certainly, uh, oh, in, terms of, in terms of effective bandwidth with high error rates, um, the yeah. stuff on the right um, has a higher effective band, uh, bandwidth, right? Because you're using inference in order to fill in what uh, the code could mean. But you might be wrong. And um, but in terms, of, in terms of our collective achievements, I'd say that the highest ones are the ones which are um, generated by the largest number of people and accumulate changes over the largest amount of time. Um, <laughs> oh, and, and, and the sad thing about that is that it might not that uh, that might not be libraries anymore. It might be it might be uh, false um, beliefs propagated and uh, mutated in the internet. <laughs> right. So they, they may be uh, you know, computationally they may be the uh, most complex things that we are. They may be the things that we're uh, um, putting the most computation into optimizing at the moment. That's a little bit, I, I, I sort of hadn't really thought about that before, but that's, uh, that's probably true, a little bit alarming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I enjoyed the lecture actually, really stimulated some thinking. Um, for the human and being, you know, even the human expert, they're really slow actually, and even though I have good, have very good knowledge, knowledge very good, but in terms of the real action, they are slow. So we try to solve the problem. Right. Um, for example, we, we know the tumor is there, we do the same antigen, we can do slice by slice. It takes time. But right. the computer, we can and let decompose into right. several. It took groups. humans 3,000 years to get good at chess, it took a computer four hours. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. So the, the traditionally, we, we, the, we try to utilize, for example, decision tree to solve the same problem. We try to decompose, as you said, to shift to the left side using. Well, very concrete, uh, very right. precise logic. Right, so that we can parallelize, and we do that so that we can parallelize the solution of the problem. Yeah. But nowadays, the, the, uh, the, the convolutional neural network, deep learning network, uh, we are uh, using another way, using multiple data and uh, multiple instances to have good generalization ability to train this kind of model so that it uh, can be uh, uh, perform very faster and more accurate in comparison to the traditional decision tree. Right. So what's your comments? Do you think this kind of direction purely depends on the data based on kind of a stabilized model and in comparison to the traditional decomposed, the more specific logic? So 
I think I, I, I think both. I think there are uh, many things which are useful for us to do where there aren't sufficient data to adequately constrain them. On the other hand, I wouldn't make a strong bet on that. So uh, a, a lot of people think that um, you're building up a world, a world model really requires um, uh, a lot of people think that, for example, building a realistic model of the world requires interaction in the world, it requires experimentation. I'm, um, I think experimentation is extremely useful at um, constraining your rapidly constraining your model space, especially if you're doing it in an information theoretically uh, you know, near optimal way, right? With active learning or something like that. But on the other hand. There are there's an enormous amount of text out there written by humans, you know, describing uh, the world, uh, behaviors in the world, human behaviors in the world, uh, things uh, behaviors which are constrained by facts about the world, and so on and so forth. So it's not. Um, so I, I I kind of don't buy the strong embodiment hypothesis, for example. Um, I think it's entirely possible that if a machine can read all of human literature, and it builds the best predictive model, the best and most pre uh, general predictive um, and causal model it can out of that. You know, beyond our ability at the moment, um, it wouldn't surprise me if it, uh, if its behavior was indistinguishable from that of a machine that had uh, learned by acting in the world. So I think that um, the, 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 the space here is of of possibilities is quite large, and I think people stake out too many claims about what's going to be necessary or what's not going to be sufficient, or whether um, you know whether data will or won't be enough. I've got friends who fight about this um, uh, in public, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, all right. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think we 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 simply don't know. We have opinions about what kind of. Um, Variants on this are going to be good to pursue. So, for example, um, it's a lot easier to get a large amount of text, right, and apply learning to it. And as a result of doing that, we've got these very good language models now, like GPT-2, right. So, in terms of ease, and that we still seem to be succeeding, um, the kind of uh, data and text-driven approach seems to be worthwhile because it's like really hard to build robots and have them go around and do stuff. On the other hand, there's a sort of whole other approach where people are building these extremely uh, realistic simulation environments where these uh, machines can be embodied. On the other hand, you know those machine, those environments can all be described in a few megabytes of code. So uh, again, you know they're kind of equivalent to stuff which might be written down. I, I, I really, I really don't know. I think we have to make these decisions on you know, what what we find is interesting, what might work, what's e easy enough, what the, our computers are fast enough to uh, uh, to do, and making making really strong claims about what class of things are going to work in the end just seems to me to be ill-advised. Yeah, I have a question like what do you what do you think of the role of unsupervised learning or self-supervised learning in this domain? Because you said like like something like GPT two with yeah. I think one point five billion parameters, huge amount of knowledge. So should we like folk uh, like create our research around these modules which contains already an enormous amount of knowledge and like find out ways to how to adapt that knowledge into our other task. Well, certainly, I've uh, one of my one of my PhD students is uh, um, so right. So I um, I think right. So GPD two, for example, is a form of knowledge, right? It's a skill that can be applied to a variety of other tasks and might aid you at um, learning to do those tasks better with fewer data, right? I think for almost all natural language processing tasks, starting with one of those language, the representations of one of those language models is likely to decrease the amount of work that you have to do downstream. So yes, you should always use, use knowledge and GP, if, if it's relevant to your um, problem. I also think that uh, if you've got a choice to use um, self-supervised or distantly supervised or unsupervised learning, for something that's actually interesting and going to make progress, do it, right? I mean, you know, uh, even in New Zealand, we have lots of fast computers, right? So why would you, you know, why would you waste a person's time if a computer can do it all itself? So we should absolutely um, use those techniques 
um, as much as we can as we get better at them. Uh, at them. And the same applies, of course, to sort of you know, reinforcement learning approaches, where you can you, you can say, okay, I've got this oracle that I can build, and you have to work out all the rest of the stuff yourself. Right? We should always do that. Um, when we can, and then you know, if you can't do that, you should use data, but you should use as little as possible by um, by importing an inductive bias like GPT-2 or like um, you know the first n layers of like, um, <coughs> whatever the winning uh, version of an internet is at the moment, right? Um, uh, or the, the or if you can get it, you know the first uh, n layers of Google Translate multilingual, uh, which unfortunately you can't get that. Um, maybe there's a public. You know, a public version of that would be really useful. So whenever you can, you should do that. Yeah, but don't but go after the go after the problems which seem reachable and will make the biggest, fastest impact, and then solve them using these techniques if you can. On the other hand, if you're doing a PhD and want to finish in four years, um, so it's a problem which is practical and uh, optimize the heck out of it by doing the minimum amount of work um, to get. Uh, enough publications by using uh, as much of the previous work as possible. Uh, your magnum opus should probably work, uh, wait until after your PhD is over, unless you're really lucky. Yeah. Even in Goodfellow had a PhD before he invented GANs. Right? So, yeah. All right, with that, I'd like to thank the speaker and a small talk of the presentation. Thank you very much. What is it?